and welcome to the third episode of our Trafalgar Fire Passive Fire training series. Um, I'm your host today, John Henry, and we'll be looking at Passive Fire legislation, aka the building code. So when it comes to Passive Fire in general, the NCC, National Construction Code, formerly known as the Building Code of Australia, or BCA, uh, is our legislative document. It is available online for free through the ABCB website. And Section C is all about Passive Fire protection. When it comes to service penetrations, we look at C3.15. Before we jump into it, just a quick note about how the NCC actually works. So it's a performance-based building code, and it's sort of a one-size-fits-all approach to construction. It tells you what the performance of the building needs. Uh, basically, it tells you how high you need to jump, and then we need to show it that we can jump at that high. And there are two ways of doing that. The first way is to follow what they call the Deem to Satisfy pathway, which is a prescribed pathway that's laid out in section C for passive fire, or you can meet the performance requirements confirmed on a specific site through fire engineering. Following the DTS deemed to satisfy pathway, um, the way it works is we need to show some evidence or documents of compliance to show that the passive fire systems that we are installing on the sites will meet the requirements of the NCC. And that in theory will give us a compliant and safe building. All of the products that Trafalgar Fire Cell are uh, aimed to be deemed to satisfy. There are instances where there is simply nothing tested on the market where fire engineering becomes uh, a useful approach and we'll dive into that in one of the later episodes. So looking at section C3.15, opening for service installations. I've included a snippet here. Up the top, the introduction says where an electrical, electronic, plumbing, mechanical ventilation, air conditioning or other service penetrates building element, other than an external wall or roof that's required to have an FRL with respect to integrity, insulation, or resistance to the incipient spread of fire if it's a ceiling, that the installation must comply with one of the following. Now that is a really wordy chunk of sentence. So to break it down, it's saying, well, you have a building service that penetrates through a building element that has an FRL. And if it's a ceiling, the FRL needs to have the resistance to the incipient spread of fire. Then you must comply with one of the following options. Option A is the most common, um, and that is the tested system. So what it says here is the service, the building element and the protection method at the penetration must be identical with the prototype assembly of the service, the building element and protection method, which has been tested in accordance with AS 472 and AS 1530 part four. And it must achieve the required FRL or resistance to the incipient spread of fire, again, if it's a ceiling. Or you can have a differ from a prototype assembly of the service, the building element and protection method in accordance with section four of AS 472. So let's break down these, these two options. Option A, basically saying you need to take what's done on site um, and mock it up in an identical way in a test. So that includes the building element, the wall, floor, or ceiling. It includes if it's plaster, how many layers of plaster, what orientation it's installed into, vertical or horizontal. You take the service as well. So if it's copper pipe, steel pipe, plastic pipe, cables, cable bundles, cable trays, whatever it might be, you have to take that same service and the protection method that you want to use. So the sealant, the wrap, the boards, the bats, whatever it might be that you're trying to use to fire seal the penetration. And you have to do an identical test in an accredited laboratory to ACE 1530 part four. And that's how you get an FRL for the penetration. Now, obviously that word there identical can cause some interpretation issues on site. Getting an identical test can often be uh, pretty difficult depending on your interpretation of the word identical. Uh, so that's where B comes into it, which is you're allowed to differ from that prototype test in accordance with section four of AS4072. So AS4072 allows the testing labs to write a formal opinion to give you variations from what was tested. So for example, if you test a small bundle of cables and a large bundle of cables, the labs might be able to write you an opinion to say you can have all the cable sizes in between. And AS4072 gives the guidelines for how they can write those opinions. As I said, the systems must be identical to the tested system, or you can have a minor variation approved through an accredited lab through AS4072. Now, the key to this is we're testing a system and not a product. Now, I fall into this trap all the time of calling our products fire-added products, but there's no such thing as a fire-added product. There's no fire-added collar, there's no fire-added sealant, there's no fire-added box. They're all fire-added systems. And what I mean by that is if you seal a uh, copper pipe with a fire-added sealant, you might pass the fire test. If you use that same fire added sealant on a PVC pipe, the pipe's gonna melt away and it's gonna fail the test. So just because you do one test with a product doesn't mean that's a fire added product. It means the system that you tested is fire added. 
And that system comprises of the fire barrier orientation, be it horizontal or vertical, the fire barrier material, so there's concrete, masonry, plasterboard, and proprietary systems like Hebel and Speed Panel and Walsk, the fire barrier thickness of the plasterboard, how many layers, how thick was the stud, um, then the service specifications themselves. So what type of pipe or cable it was passing through, and then the fire stopping specification. So how much sealant was installed? Um, was it sold to the full depth of the barrier or just a certain amount? Was there a fillet installed? Was the penetration system wrapped with something to increase the insulation performance? All of these things form a complicated system. And that's why it can be difficult to have an identical prototype done in a test lab to meet identically what's been done on site. There are instances where you can do that and that's when test reports will become handy evidence of compliance. Um, but in other instances, that's where we lean on AS4072 for formal assessments. So I've included this slide to give a visual representation of what a good fire stopping system should include. Um, you need to take into account the fire barrier, the opening size that was cut for the service penetration, the service penetration types, the manufacturer's instructions, the fire stopping products used and the brand of product, labeling and paperwork to go with it, the fire test data in accordance with AS4072 and 1530 part four, and the last one here, good workmanship, which is something I think is often um, overlooked for passive fire. Uh, passive fire is quite a complicated niche um, area of the building code. Um, so it does need some good workmanship to end up with a, a compliant and a safe system on site. So to show you the differences between a test report and an assessment report, I'm gonna run through an example of some of the R&D that we've done in the last few years. So I'm going to open up a test report, FRT180392, which is a test report for our FireFlex sealant and our T-Wrap in accordance with AS1530 Part 4, 2014. And we're going to look at a tested system in specimen F. And we're going to find out the details to this tested system. So I've opened up our test report, which was done at the testing lab called Warrington Fire down in Victoria. So once we've done the test, they provide us with um, a test report. And we're going to run through it and show you exactly how to read these things. So the test report cover page tells us it was a penetration system um, in, in accordance with AS 1530 part four, 2014. Um, these test reports do get quite lengthy. This one's 54 pages long. Um, so I'm not gonna go through each specimen, but we'll do a case study on specimen F, which was a hundred mil steel pipe. It was sealed with Fireflex sealant and T-wrap. The aperture that was installed into the wall was 127 millimeters. So again, very, uh, very restrictive if you look back through that word identical uh, to get a 127 millimeter hole on every site. Um, and it got 120 minutes of integrity and insulation performance, dash 120, 120. So pretty good result. Um, so that's just an overview that gives you some of the system, um, but to really understand what was tested, you need to dive in and have a look. So the report gives you everything you need to understand what was tested. It's, think of it like a high school science lab report, it gives you the method, it gives you the assumptions, and it gives you the test results. Um, so it tells you the tested system uh, consisted of two layers of 13 mil fire check fire at a board fixed onto both sides of a 64 mil steel stud to create a wall that was 116 mil thick overall uh, with studs at 600 mil centers. And it had 10 varying service penetrations sealed by Fireflex sealant T-wrap in our bats for some other specimens. Um, so again, we'll stick to specimen F. Um, so the way Warrington Fire lay out their um, parts of the system, they have this lovely table and you can look up all the different components. So the sealant, Fireflex sealant, it tells you a bit about the sealant, how it's installed. Uh, the wrap was T-wrap, it gives you the density and how it was installed. Um, and then it has all the services listed as well. So down the bottom here is a 100 mil steel pipe, nominal bore 100. They give you the, uh, the inside and outside dimensions of the pipe here. And again, going back to that word identical from the building code, they've measured these pipes to two decimal places of a millimeter, which again is, is not the most practical thing to, to try and uh, comply with on a, on a building site. Um, so typically these are tied back to certain sizes or standard sizes of pipe. And again, that's when the assessment reports come in really handy to, uh, to clarify this sort of thing. Um, so if we go through to specimen F down here, it tells us how the entire system was put together. It tells you how the pipe was supported and penetrated into the furnace and away from the furnace, um, the aperture size and the local fire stopping system. So it says here sealant was applied to the annular gaps between the service and the separating element 
to a nominal 15 mil fillet on both the exposed and unexposed sides of the wall. 300 mil and 100 mil long strips of T-wrap wrapped around the surface on both the exposed and unexposed side to form a nominal 400 mil length of T-wrap with a 50 mil overlap. So the T-wrap's held in place with aluminium reinforced tape in this test. There's also a note here to say that there was a service support that was within that 400 mil, so that was wrapped around by the T-wrap as well. And there's a note here, see figure one and figure three and appendix A for more detail. So let's go ahead and do that. So section five gives us the performance, specimen F. At 130 minutes, there was no failure of integrity or insulation. So we get the dash 120, 120 FRL. Um, appendix A gives us the drawings from the test. Um, so if we look at specimen F, you can see here and I'll zoom in. It shows you exactly how the sealant was installed to the plaster. It shows you how the T-wrap was installed and it gives those nice little reference numbers that tie back to the table at the start. Then Appendix B gives you observations from the test. So they give you minute by minute observations, specimen F. It was luckily a nice and boring specimen for us. So not much happened. Uh, there was a bit of smoke that came out of the end of the service. So oil tends to burn off from inside the pipe. Not much happened until 130 minutes when the test was completed. Then you get some photos of the specimens and where the temperatures were uh, were measured by the thermocouples. If we look at specimen F here, the thermocouples were, were placed onto the wall adjacent to the specimen, onto the wrap that was installed around the pipe, at the end of the wrap, and then on the bare metal pipe itself. So that's a way that the lab can figure out the temperature of each different component of the system during the test. Then of course you get your, your thermal readouts from those thermocouples. Um, you get the temperatures from the furnace um, compared to what the, the, the standard tells you you need to, to meet for the furnace. And that tells you, you know, at, at uh, two hours time, you're sitting just over a thousand degrees. They also log the furnace pressure and they'll have a thermal readout for each specimen. So specimen F was this, this one here. So each of those little thermocouples feeds back into a data logger and you can read off the insulation performance from this graph. So we started at around 25 degrees and noting that the insulation failure is 180 degree temperature rise, uh, the failure limit would be around 205 degrees. So at two hours, um, we still had a good 20 or 30 degrees of margin in this specimen. So quite a comfortable pass. Steel pipes are usually a pretty, uh, pretty safe bet. So that is how you read the test report. What I'll do now is I'll have a look at an assessment report where they use the same data from this test to include it into some variations and, and give us a bigger applicability of range. So now here I've opened up our assessment report for our Fireflex and TRAP system, um, FCO 1579. And this is provided by the CSIRO and they've done an assessment report which ties together all of the testing in our Fireflex um, arsenal into one nice, neat compliance document. Um, so that's really helpful when we're trying to get our documentation um, across to the end user and to the PCA on site or building surveyor so that they can check what's been installed on site matches the tested system. Now what we'll do here is we'll dig into it and find out where that specimen F from the test report we looked at um, rears its head in this assessment. So assessments are written in a different way. These are on a test report because it's not one specific test. It is a formal opinion from the labs. Now these ones do have expiry dates written into them, whereas test reports don't. Um, and they're typically given a validity of five to 10 years, depending on the lab and depending on the content. Um, so the supporting data for this assessment is given here. Um, there's a nice big table of uh, a few decades worth of Fireflex testing. Uh, and what they do is they take those tests and they give variations. Um, so if we look at 3.3, metal pipes, penetrating walls, protected with T-wrap or fire wrap. So this is where we'll find that specimen we just tested. So the proposed construction comprises of metal pipes as tested in FRT 180392, which is the report we looked at, and as well as a few other reports. And that allows us to have variations to the pipe size and materials as shown in table two. The gap size between the pipe and the opening shall be a maximum of 10 mil. So that uh, dissipates that issue of having to have the exact size hole as tested. We can have a maximum 10 mil annular gap. The Fireflex sealant will be based on design also justified in this report. Um, variation of the wrap length based on design. Um, because we did a two hour test, um, the labs are happy to look at assigning different FRLs for lower, uh, lower performance requirements. Uh, variation to include localized wall thickening for some wall types like speed panel. Um, it can also include 
the substitution of fire wrap for the tear wrap material. Uh, fire wrap being a thicker material, it was an easy justification. Um, so that is how you do the variations for each different application. And then you get the summary page, which has these lovely tables. So let's look at steel pipe penetrations in walls. And the tested system we just looked at was two layers of 13 mil plasterboard or 116 mil thick wall for dash 12120. So there's a nominal bore 100 mil pipe and there's the 400 mil tear app that was tested. Um, so that's how that test report gets included here. And you can see they've given it a range of other sizes that can be uh, included. And for smaller pipes, they've been able to justify a small length of wrap as well. Um, from there, they've been able to do variations from not just this wall type, but to other types of wall, um, including uh, 70 mil, 75 mil AAC panels and speed panel and a few other things. So assessments are very useful for the industry in general because fire testing each in every identical application would bankrupt the industry overnight. Um, so assessments are a necessary part of the industry um, to give the compliance in, in a way that's going to make the paperwork and the documentation side of things much easier. Um, so to wrap up the example, the tested system um, as per the test report or the assessment report to AS4072, either of these two documents can be used as your evidence of compliance on a site. And that is how you get a tested system. Now there are some insulation waivers written into C3.15, insulation being that heat transfer component of the FRL. Um, so I've highlighted it here. Um, if you comply with the tested system as per option I, you can waive the insulation criteria um, only if the service is a pipe system comprised entirely of metal and any combustible building element is not able to be located within 100 millimetres of that service for a distance of two metres from the penetration. So it's basically saying if you don't have combustible materials around the pipe, even if the pipe gets hot, it can't spread the fire. Makes, makes logical sense. There is another part here, uh, part C, which says combustible materials not able to be located within 100 mil of the service for a distance of two metres. So not only can you not have combustible materials at the time of certification, you're not allowed to have it able to be located um, for the life of the building. Um, and lastly, of course, it's not, you can't apply this clause to a fire at an exit. Um, this does cause some uh, confusion in the industry. Um, this is an example of why you, a lot of certifiers these days aren't giving out the, the waiver for performance, uh, for insulation performance. Uh, because people like to use these cupboards to store things in and the poor PCA or building surveyor doesn't know for the life of the building um, if this is going to happen after they've signed it off. So often is the case the best, most safe and conservative thing to do is to wrap the, uh, the penetration systems and there are thankfully a lot of penetration uh, wrapping systems available on the market that are cost effective. Um, so it shouldn't be much of a shock uh, these days. Uh, you will find older buildings where um, the wrap hasn't been installed uh, as compliant to standards of the time. Uh, but moving forward, it's our recommendation that everyone should be wrapping service penetrations regardless of the environment they're in. Now, section B of C3.15 is specifically for ventilation and air conditioning, um, which refers you to AS1668 part one. So this is ducts and dampers. Um, and conveniently 1668 part one points you back to AS1530 part four. So A and B are essentially the same thing. You need a tested system or in a system that's been assessed uh, through AS4072 through the accredited labs. Lastly, there is specification C3.15, which is different to C3.15, different part of the code, the specification. S openings for service installations can comply with spec C3.15, but in my opinion, it's a part of the building code that's quite old and outdated and really should be removed because it is near impossible to comply with. So to comply with this spec, um, it only applies to pipes that are uh, not filled with a liquid or flammable gas. They must not be located near combustion materials, again, for the life of the building. Uh, for cables, they need to be in 50 mil or smaller diameter openings. Uh, fire stopping system used need to be tested to ISO 540, which is a coal and coke ash testing standard. Um, also need to be tested to AS1530 part four to achieve the required FRL in a blank opening. So you still have to do the fire testing anyway. So there's a lot of hurdles to jump through to comply with this. Um, and ISO 540 testing is something that is, uh, is quite rare in the industry or it's not been done in accredited labs. So my advice is always to avoid the specification, stick to the tested system. Um, that will give you the most compliant and the most safe option for your site and it'll remove any headaches or arguments you might have with your PCA certified. 
Now, what happens if there's nothing tested or assessed for your application? Is it time to panic? Uh, a little reference for the Simpsons fans here. Um, no, obviously it's not time to panic. There are other options um, if you can't find a tested system for what you're trying to do. Um, so fire engineers are able to assess each site based on their individual performance requirements. And what I mean by that is the building code assumes things like fuel loads, uh, distance to exits and egress are all the same for every building or every class of building. Fire engineers can go in and look specifically at this scenario. There might not be as much fuel load or there might be, you know, uh, an egress or an exit near the penetration in question, which might make the um, the fire engineers comfortable to write a performance based solution and they can reduce the FR requirements or find other ways to uh, change what needs to be done to make it a safe installation. Now, I don't, wouldn't recommend fire engineering be used for every penetration system. Uh, generally, fire engineers um, can be quite subjective, so different ones will have different thoughts and different answers. They also charge um, money, they're, they're professional consultancy. Um, so if you have the opportunity to fix a penetration by just reworking it, um, that, that makes much more sense and gives you a much easier path of compliance. However, if it's a building wide problem, if the same penetration is repeated a thousand times up the building um, and the cost of rectification might be more than what it would cost to engage a fire engineer, that's obviously when it would make more sense to go and annoy the fire engineers. Now, not to say that we won't just wash our hands and say there's nothing tested, go away. Uh, at Trafalgar Fire, we pride ourselves on working with fire engineers to find solutions and back them up with the test data we do have to give them conservative data to hang their hat on when they write their performance solutions. So just to summarize, evidence of compliance for the building code, you can have a test report um, in accordance with AS 1530 part four, where the specimen is identical to what's been done on site, or it's within the permissible variations, which are in AS 1530 part four. I'll talk a bit about those in the next episode. You can have an assessment report from a registered testing authority, um, or you can have a performance solution done by a qualified fire safety engineer. Anything else like test certificates, system certificates, uh, data sheets, tech guides, they're essentially sales tools or installation tools. And most PCAs or building surveyors won't accept them on building sites. It's got to be one of those three, uh, three options that we talked about. So what is fire testing in AS 1530 part four? Great question. Uh, we'll dive into it in the next episode. So stay tuned for that. And we'll show you some of the really cool fire testing photos and what it actually means to do a fire test. I'll see you there.